Hello, everyone, and welcome to End to End, the podcast where we talk about all things funny and a few things not. I'm your host, Duhad. Join me, as always, are the Lightning Rabbit. Uh, Cabral 95. Uh, Firebolt. Uh, and that's it. So last week, we actually tried to record a lovely little episode for you uh, fine folks, where we were talking about the release of episode uh, three of season four. Unfortunately, that due to three failed recording sessions. I thought it was four. Uh, four of you include the one that uh, Firebolt did on his own. Uh, we don't have that. So we're going to today talk about season four, episode three, and season four, episode four. Lovely. Okay. Anyway, gentlemen, season four came out. We all really enjoyed the uh, the pilot. Uh, but now we're into the proper, you know, day-to-day, <clears throat> sorry, week-to-week episodes that will be defining most of the season uh, until presumably we get to the uh, the end, end of time. the uh, season where we'll probably have another two-parter. Mm. So, now that we're into what is probably going to be the meat of most of the episodes, what did you guys think about season four, episode three? Let's go alphabetically. What? Let's go alphabetically. No, that, what? no that, if we were doing alphabetically, we'd start with Daring Don't because that starts with a D. I meant with people talking oh, about it. No, no, never mind. No, Castlemania starts with a C. So never mind. No, okay, Castlemania. Castlemania. I was going to say, Castlemania starts with a C. <laughs> right, right, right. Anyway, point is, we're, we're going in order of episode dyslexia. release. No, 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 he meant people talking about it. Alphabetical order. Right. Yeah. Anyway, Castlemania, first one. The one that we actually missed last week. Well, I guess I can go. I don't yeah, know. if we're doing go, alphabetically, go you need to go. Yeah. Well, no, actually, A N A L or A S. Uh, yeah, I guess I go first. Anyways, um, well, personally for me, I quite enjoyed uh, Castlemania. It was very humorous episode. It felt like a Scooby Doo sort of esque feel to it, with the whole mystery going on, which wasn't a mystery. Um, I don't know. It just had those kind of jokes in there and everything, and I love the Hall of Hooves and Rarity like touching Rainbow Dash, and I felt that was hilarious. And Rarity crying for some reason made me laugh. I also enjoy this because we get to see a continual story involving the mysterious box of wonders, probably full of Cheerios or mm. Twilight Cane. <laughs> just but um, I, <clears throat> exactly. I did quite enjoy that. <clears throat> um, also, we get to look at the old castle in more detail, which was always nice. Uh, see a bit of the library. I wish we could see more of the history involved in there, because that statue of the alicorn or Pegasus, you know, whatever that statue was, a large horse head. It wasn't a pony; it was obviously a horse head. So that intrigued me. I was wondering if there's like any story involving that, which it probably isn't. The only thing I'm now concerned with is the pony of shadows and the mysterious box of Cheerios. Uh, yeah. Actually, I'd say that there is uh, something to be said for the fact that uh, a lot of the history bits that we've seen, the uh, the stylized history bits, like the uh, the history in the beginning of episode one, mm-hmm. uh, tends to draw the uh, ponies with a more equine, horse-like uh, design rather than the more cartoonishly uh, exaggerated features that the actual characters have. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm, it is actually something uh, worth kind of wondering about, like why, why they uh, go with that. Is it to uh, is it just an aesthetic choice about uh, you know kind of creating an old uh, antiquity feel, or is it deliberate? Like is it uh, you know meant to imply that maybe uh, the fact that uh, Celestia and Luna kind of have a slightly more force like uh, you know uh, design uh, outline wise yeah. uh, is something that apparently used to be a thing or i mean it, it, it's probably just there is saddle there is saddle arabia as well that's the yeah. land of horses so true so it's... you know there it's probably nothing but a simple aesthetic choice but it does lead to some interesting bits of span uh yeah. speculation speculation yeah uh firebolt you were coughing during cabral's little bit there you uh have an opinion on castlemania um yes i uh Jerk. I really enjoyed the episode. Um, it was it, it, it's one of those that was um, kind of intriguing Thank me you. even before it came out, um, and actually it came out before it came out. But anyway, um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, no, it, it, um, I love the fact that they're they came they they kind of um, redesigned that entire area for season four. Um, like when they're walking up to the castle. Um, you know the the entire landscape around it has now changed since we first saw it in in, in uh, season one, 
you know, if you go back and, and, and watch the very first episode, or I guess it would be the second episode when they actually get to the castle, but um, if you go back and watch that, uh, it looks so much different, and I'm glad that we actually got this whole redesign of that entire area. Um, and uh, like Ross said, it was it's really nice to go and see you know, the inside of the castle and actually get to see what it was like. Um, one of the things that I found really amusing was um, when she's reading from the diary and the and uh, Celestia wrote that, you know, they're using the um, traps and stuff like that as almost like rides. She said the trap door slide is Luna's favorite, and I thought that was really funny. Um, another thing was that, you know, you got the separate groups that went there, obviously, because Twilight and Spike went there uh, to search for information about the box. Fluttershy and Rarity went as a group because Rarity uh, was uh, going to uh, renovate the, the tapestries and wall art and stuff like that. And uh, Rainbow Dash and Applejack were there as most daring uh, to, to decide who was the most daring pony. Um, and these groups seem to be like our core because. Um, you know, Fluttershy and Rarity already have a uh, going relationship where they have uh, the spa, you know, they, they, they have the phase, spa yeah. treatment yeah, and stuff like that. And obviously, uh, Applejack and, Apple and Rainbow Dash have their relationship where they're rivals and stuff like that. So it, it's it, I'm glad that they kept these core groups together for this episode. Yes, um, it, it does uh, kind of feel like they're they're sort of going like, yeah, they, these are a group of friends. But even in a group of friends, there are certain friends who just naturally kind of do slightly better together than other uh, members of the friend group, even though everyone in the yeah. group obviously likes each other and hangs out all together. It's, it's right. like splitting up the muffin loving team and just going on like adventure. Put me with Fireboat, and then you two go together on an adventure, and then so kinds of different things would happen, sort of thing. Yeah, not, not entirely dissimilar to that. Yeah. And uh, it's also like. Um, it, I also felt that that was really good because this is a new author. It was Josh Haber that wrote this. He's a new he he's a new writer for season four, so he's never done these episodes before. And I felt that he did a really good job uh, with the characterization of each of the characters, and and uh, he got it right um, for and for a first time writer that that's really good. Nice, nice. Yeah, uh, can't can't complain about that. Uh, Lightning Rider, your thoughts? Well. To bring us back to a point that was stated earlier, I think that inside that box is probably <laughs> going to be the Twilight Cane equivalent of the Sovereign Orb. It's just going to be the head of the cane with like a little cross at the top of it. I like the actually, idea that, of that. Actually, actually, now I think about you, that you said something like that. Obviously, the elements of harmony are powerful magic. However, you saying some Sovereign Orb makes me think, well... What if it is something more powerful than the Elder's Heart? You just to trump them and make it feel as if we don't need anything yeah. else. And I'm just going to say, the Sovereign Orb, if you throw that at someone, it would probably hurt. So you can use that in a substitute of the Elements of Harmony. Here's a picture. Um, right, okay. <laughs> you, you realize that now you're going to have to put this on yeah. the video. Anything I gotta to... walk my other computer and look at this picture. It's not bad. Anything to promote the crown jewels. Um, <laughs> but anything. Anyway, um, I think that the one of the Sovereign things... Orb. One of the things I love about this episode is the backgrounds of the old castle with all the tapestries oh. and like little mm -hmm. bits of banners and stuff hanging down the walls. And also a scene which I didn't see when I was watching the episode, but someone pointed out to me later, when Applejack, I'm going to say it was Applejack, flips over and goes on the outside of the building. Yep, Applejack. Is that her? Yeah. Yep. The scene, that, like the level of detail on the outside with the gargoyle and everything like that, and like this massive expanse of land down at the bottom of the castle. Wide tracts of land. Yeah, it's beautiful. Miles, it is absolutely miles. beautiful. <laughs> um, so yeah, that I was really impressed with that. The uh, kind of art direction. There was only one thing, which I think it was an animation error, which was Fluttershy's hair. Didn't go behind her ear oh. in one shot, so it looked like a wig. But that's okay. Oh, yeah, I, I remember that. Yeah, it's, uh, as we get with Flash, it occasionally, yeah. and actually, you know, yeah. it's yeah. a little bit weird. Yeah. And I want to mention, like, uh, like you said with the tapestries, I like what Duhat said in the last three recordings that didn't happen. Um, huh. That Rarity's going back for 
to restore these tapestries and it's something you don't see a lot of you know shows kind of cover like restoring old things from the past yeah yeah there's it, there's a lot of uh you know like kid shows and stuff that will kind of pay a bit of lip service to the idea of like archaeology and that like oh we're going back to get these things so we can shove it in a museum or oh we're gonna get this cool old thing so we can put it up in our house isn't that cool it's what or, oh wait, let's go and like find this thing and then leave it alone because history has to be preserved but there, there are very few like even though it's kind of clear that rarity is you know, at least at first, doing it largely to essentially steal the tapestries so she well, can, of course. Uh, yeah, use them for some weird uh, fashion line. You know, her, her <laughs> end goal ends up the being, entire one. Yeah, but it's like her, her end goal ends up being legitimately to try to res- like actually do a proper restoration job on the old pieces of art, yeah. which is something you don't see in kids shows. That's actually like a, you know, it's closer to what actual, uh, you know. Uh, uh, archaeological, uh, you know, like uh, groups will sometimes actually do is, you know, try and like restore. Like, uh, there, there have been many efforts yeah, to restore, like, the Sistine Chapel, uh, restoring, uh, you know, old pieces of art, cleaning off grunge and stuff. Yeah, restoring you know, that's, the Third Reich. That, that that's um, something that we don't want to do, but, you know. <laughs> um, uh, it's yeah, historical. Well, you've, been, you've been spending too much time with uh, cotton candy, haven't you? You're getting into the whole <laughs> rarities and Nazi no, mindset. No, not at all. Oh, not the oh lordy but uh yeah personally i actually really like this episode uh uh <clears throat> yeah they have a good uh good use of all three uh, all six of the uh, main characters uh split into largely three groups technically pinky is kind of in her own group on her <laughs> own but she she's, she's not like really me. in the episode as much as she kind of bookends the episode She's with Gummy, obviously. Yeah, uh, but no, I mean that that's that's fine. That works. Uh, the thing is, they they do uh, well with all the characters individually. Uh, even though Pinky is kind of uh, given a l- smaller role, her role is actually one that feels a little bit more in character than a lot of the stuff that she had going on in season three. Uh, she felt a little bit more like she was kind of following her own weird, you know, logic rather than just random. Yeah. Mm. Uh, which is always nice. But apart from that, I also, you know, am just extremely That's biased cool though, towards uh, any opportunities to see Fluttershy and Rarity having some scenes together because they have great chemistry. They're very funny together. And they're probably my two favorite uh, members of the main six. So having an opportunity to uh, have a char- an episode that focuses fairly heavily on them uh, is great, especially considering the fact that season three had very little for Rarity to do. And it's been a while since we've had Flourish episodes that weren't uh, either more about other characters, you know, like the, uh, you know, Keep Calm, Flutter On, or where the lesson wasn't a repeat of, you've got to learn to be brave. Yeah, be assertive. That's 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 always her episodes. Yeah, and and so I liked some of those episodes. They're really, you know, some of them were really well done, but she does tend to get the same lesson over and over again. So giving her an opportunity to... I mean, she's still not the main character of this episode or anything, but she has a little bit more agency than she often does in her episodes. And uh, her whole bit with Angel was actually, you know, quite fun. Uh, You know, basically kind of changing it. So at first she starts out being very scared, uh, but then her motivation changing from being terrified for herself to being, you know, protective and terrified for her pet was a nice change of pace. That's something that you don't actually, you know, like her caring for animals is something that often comes up, but she never really, you know, that's never really the focus of the story. It's just sort of a background detail. So having her main motivation in the story actually being animal related was a really nice touch. And I like the fact that Angel being in this episode, um, he, he didn't seem to be as much of a dick as he usually is. Yeah, he's usually... He's usually pretty awful. I mean, he's he's kind of a jerk, but he's uh, in this one he's a little bit less jerkish. Well, he except was a carrot, so he's just he was just in a good mood. Yeah, well, except towards Spike, who he remains a massive jerk towards. Well, no, I was wondering if that changed at the end of season three. You know, with you know, with, with yeah, with he, it was a little, that, he's a little less mean spirited, I think, in this one, but than he often is with Spike. But he's still clearly got sort of a rivalry going on with him uh, but that's fine you know part of what makes Angel a fun character is the fact that he is the sort of jerk to Fluttershy's uh, ultra kind doormat 
Ultra yeah. kind doormat. She is the ultra kind doormat. Buy today your local Walmart. Yes. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, take a brief second just to uh, yeah look at the end of this episode before we move on to uh, the next one. Uh, and that is that we, uh, at, at, over the course of season three, the letters to Celestia pretty much just sort of died off. Uh, it was like two. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they weren't officially canceled, but they were, it was pretty clear that they really were only put in by certain writers who just sort of remembered, oh, wait, that's, that's a thing, isn't oh, it? Yeah, that's a thing, isn't it? Uh, and, and in a lot of cases, they had, uh, you know, in areas where they didn't have letters, they did have other things. They had, like, people you know, talking to each other or people musing on things or writing to other characters or other things like that. So it was clear that they were kind of looking around, like they, they weren't done with doing lessons yet because that's, you know, obviously something that's good for the kids, but they weren't really sure they wanted to do uh, the friendship letters anymore. And uh, this season introduces the diary as a replacement journal yeah, journal the journal diary sissy and lame it's a journal <laughs> right a journal <laughs> it's family uh, they, they have world a, that we a journal that all the characters are <laughs> writing in together to uh you know replace the lesson uh, the friendship lessons yes. and personally i think it's, i think it's a good thing i think that's a you know uh, it, it's a shame to see the friendship letters go but this seems like a natural development uh, a natural progression from uh yeah, where the letters had been. Well, uh-huh. it, 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 open up, it opens up opportunities because now that it doesn't have to be a certain friendship lesson, but it can be any lesson, even if it's not related to friendship. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, actually, that's a good point because at the end of episode four, I think Rainbow Dash was, uh, in some ways, it wasn't. she didn't literally write in her journal, but she said something when I think it was referring no, she, to she her. No, she actually writing. did. She was writing in the journal at the end of the Oh, episode. she was. But we'll okay. get to that at, at the, you know in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, at any rate, uh, last little thing about our two last things about the episode. One, uh, on a superfluous note, Rarity and Fluttershy freaking out and sobbing uh, as things just completely fell apart right at the end was hilarious. Yeah, I thought I thought Rarity as a whole was just hilarious in the entire episode. Yeah, definitely, she's definitely at the at, was at the top of her game in this episode. Uh, which and, actually is funny because Josh Haber said that he loves writing for Rarity as well. So well, I, I, I think we can see more of that later on. I really hope that he gets a Rarity episode to write with because uh, I think uh, actually it was a similar thing with uh, Katie Cook and Andy Price on the comics where they said that uh, I think Katie Cook uh, said that Rarity was her favorite character. Uh, and it really showed in uh, the Rarity micro comic, which was pretty, yep. pretty substantially the best micro book. Yep, which we covered in a previous episode, for those of you who have... You want to look at our, our microbook review episode. Uh, I don't but yeah, what no. episode number was that yeah, one? Yeah, I don't know. Bill will we'll figure it out. Um, but no, Katie Cook had said that Rarity was her favorite, and lo and behold, the Rarity microbook was really, really good. Uh, 23. It was episode 23, I found it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so... You know, hopefully uh, we get uh, this guy to write a really good rarity episode because he clearly gets her character and can write her very well. Anyway, the last thing about this episode before we move on to the next one, the very last thing, is the end of the episode had a bit of a teaser in the reveal or non-reveal of a mysterious shadowy figure uh, using the same animation, uh, the spoo- same spooky animation that they used for uh, Zakora with, uh, you know, shadow face, hood, and uh, gold Close. glowing eyes. Shadow gold face. Gold glowing eyes. So, what do you guys think? Re- uh, reveal of a possible late game uh, villain? Zakora messing around with people? Possible like just idea. a... Uh, you know, like a recurring uh, antagonist who uh, is actually... Well, I, 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 I know exactly what, what it is, which is nothing. No, no, no one it knows. Was a, it, was a, it was a gag that they used that has been seen in uh, Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo all the time, yeah. which is, you know, they, they, they solve the mystery, decide to find that the monster is actually someone in the costume, and then at the very end they'll show, like, the real monster. Hmm. <laughs> it's so, just like so. You, you, you think it's it's just a guess? I, I, yeah, I, I I think there's no relevance to it at all. That's yeah. the kind of feeling I'm getting from it as well personally. See, now, I would tend to gris- disagree with everyone because I have a feeling that it was Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon. Eh? <laughs> Don't ask me why. It's just a hunch, but I'm pretty sure. 
I, I think there's a decent chance that it isn't meant to be a big reveal villain because the thing is they have said uh, in the past that they are not introducing a new main villain uh, yeah. to hmm. this season. What do you mean? They brought back Alex Zotel. He's a big main villain. He's a jerk. He, he's not a new villain. Yeah. Mm, you have a valid point there, good sir. Yes. yes. Uh, but the thing is they've also kind of hinted uh, and the, the heavy emphasis on this castle in the first uh, three episodes kind of implies that we're probably not done with the ruined castle yet and i imagine if they go back there that they're not just going to drop that whole you know shadow thing and just be like yeah whatever you know it happened it happened but no we we're not gonna we're not gonna it could be it could be something to do with like a finale type deal because uh, i would assume they have to go back there uh you know with something with the harmony tree at the very end but i I guess i I don't know Um, though, again, I would like to point out who Han did say no new villains. However, it doesn't mean necessarily Pony Shadows is a villain. Yes, that's the thing. It does. It can still know. be an antagonist, but it doesn't mean he's a villain, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, don't forget, the last time they used that uh, general animation style with the shadows and the gold eyes was uh, as a red herring for Zakora. Yeah. Of course, turned out to be, you know, pretty substantially a good guy. Uh, so it's entirely possible that they are establishing a uh, you know a Chekhov's gun that will be paid off later on down the line where essentially it's like oh here's this creepy thing but not really creepy it's actually you know friendly and helpful it's actually Frankenstein's pony monster obviously it's friendly and helpful it's friendly and helpful (laughs) it looks friendly and helpful or Zakor is messing around. I mean, that's entirely possible as well. That could be it. It's normally I, what it is. I do think it would either be the one-time gag thing if they don't go back. However, I have a feeling they will go back to the castle for obvious reasons, which I can't think of right now. And so I think it might be one thing that could be an antagonist, but not necessarily a villain sort of thing. So Yes. Well, and, you know, you say no new villains, which, I mean... There might not be any major villains. You know, there, are, there are new villains. We already know about no, the There's going to be new villains. There's just no new like main antagonist season opener, season closer. Uh, right. like, it's obviously part. a misunderstood pony, but now the Corno C with the tragic past. And don't, the, hold, don't, don't forget, they said no new villains, which, also, which, of course, we've already seen that Nightmare Moon and Discord have made appearances. Uh, so it's entirely possible they could bring back, you know, more from one of them, something from It's Sombra. obviously Sombra. It's Nightmare Moon. Actually, the fact the fact that it was a Pony of Shadows, and we already know which uh, Sombra's powers are, uh, could, you know, mean something. But I, uh, I've kind of Sombra. always been against Sombra coming back if they actually do that. I'm, I'm oh, not a big fan of that idea. You're one of the uh, fans against Sombra movement. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Also, Occupy I want to point out Sombra. that... Uh, Applejack said that it was the essence of Nightmare Moon, so to speak. So if it did come back and be a major antagonist, it'd technically not be a new villain, so to speak, because it's part of Nightmare Moon. It's Nyx. Oh, God. Obviously, oh, it's hey, there we go. <laughs> the, the last thing the series needs is the introduction of another Alicorn OC, <laughs> another Alicorn uh, <laughs> who, is, uh, who, who is also the adopted daughter of Twilight. I think... Even people who like Nyx would probably just abandon the show at that point. It's like, great. <laughs> nope. 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 No, we're done the with nope this. Spider. Uh, yeah. Mm, nope. Right. Also, anyway, don't be, yeah, so... don't be, they, they do tend to notice when people, you know, get pissed. And they do, you know, want to try to avoid that. So I think it's pretty fair to say that even if they did originally have any sort of plans about doing more with uh, Twilight as a princess, they probably relatively early on in writing, you know, decided to kind of move a little bit further away from that just to avoid, you know, possibly alienating the paying fan base. True. Because, you know, we're not the primary fans or anything. They're not writing the show for us, but they do kind of sort of want us to keep paying them money for yeah. all the things that they I sell. Have to, I have to say, remember how the episode used to be day-to-day life trouble, situ- like life problem situations, and they learn a lesson from it? Now, why are they going on these epic adventures with giant mysteries and everything? Because it's cool. And to be fair, actually, to be fair on this one, uh, Lauren Faust had actually said that she kind of wanted to do more with the giant adventures and stuff. And then it was Hasbro kind of saying, no, you know, you can't do that in a girl's cartoon. You need to do more slice of life. Uh, 
uh, which was the reason why we had as much slice of life earlier on. Uh, now, admittedly, most people like the slice of life because slice of life is really good. Yeah, uh, but this isn't you know pandering or them moving away from Lauren's uh, vision. This is actually them using the fact that they can get away with more to do what Lauren had originally wanted them to do. Yeah. Point taken. But uh, so speaking of big, grand, mysterious adventures, how about that Daring Do episode, everybody? Oh yes. Uh, well, Daring- why don't you go no. and start off since I started off last or the other letter with an A in your name? I suppose. Right. Uh, actually, I prefer to go to the end, uh, let everyone else get uh, yeah, their the words up first. So let's, ha <laughs> So let's actually go in reverse, though. Uh, Lightning Rabbit, why don't you start us off? Oh. Uh, it was an alright episode. It was, it was one of those things where it was quite cool to see her, um, come back, her referring to Daring Do. Mm-hmm. I was slightly confused, though, as to... I liked her voice. Oh, no. Yeah, I, I, actually, yeah. Um... I think it was a good episode. Yeah, there's not. I don't really know what to say about it because it was the artwork was just show standard. It wasn't quite as cool as the backgrounds in Castle Mania, and there wasn't as much kind of revealed about the canon of the world in terms of like how it was created and all that sort of thing and its history. Um, so it wasn't really something that I was amazingly interested in, but it was quite interesting to see that the character from the book was actually real, and it's all like Indiana Jonesy. Obviously. Interesting. Fair That's enough. really all I've got to say about that one. <laughs> Fair no. enough. And that's all I have to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Firebolt. Uh, I know that you're a huge fan of Rainbow Dash and a fan of and the phone. And the phone. Of this episode in general. So what do you think about it? Well, um, you're right. I am a big Rainbow Dash fan. But besides just being a Rainbow Dash fan, I'm a huge Daring Do fan as well. I, it, you know, and it... it it just uh, this um, this episode was just great. Uh, if you especially were an Indiana Jones fan, I, I mean, you know, all those movies uh, were really big favorites of mine when I was younger. Um, and so you could, you get to see some of the references that they that they put in there with the the, the red line on the map as they're traveling and stuff like that. And then it's, you know, Pinkie Pie painting a line on the ground, which I thought was Remind me of Patrick Starr for some reason. Um, I love you. And then, you know, (laughs) there was a couple things that they did that I I, I thought was kind of weird. The fact that the author of the books was actually Daring Do, I I don't know if that was the best way to go about it. I don't know if that was the best way to go about it, but I did still like that, uh, like the idea of that. and just the fact that it was Rainbow Dash putting on her fangirl persona that she usually does with, like, the Wonderbolts, um, it, it was good to see it again uh, for this episode. Um, and it was, it was it, one of the funnier scenes was when uh, Rainbow Dash first takes off to look for Daring Do after she leaves. Um, and she's talking to herself, and she keeps on going back to how awesome Daring Do is, and then she keeps hitting herself in the face. Yeah. I'm surprised she didn't die from that many hits to the cheek. Yeah. You'd be surprised what a hit to the she, cheek can do. And then she <laughs> finds Daring Do, and like one of the first things she says is, I am a huge <laughs> fan. <laughs> I am a huge fan. Yeah. And so, I mean, it was it was really interesting to see rainbow in that in that light because you know and, and then of course the the lesson of the episode is is um you know i got so caught up in how awesome she was i forgot how awesome i was <laughs> which is usually how she acts i was it was it the was interesting to see rainbow it was interesting to see that rainbow was not her usual like i am so cool you know cool. and better than everyone else she's better than everyone else <clears throat> Uh, Cabral, <laughs> since you seem to not be able to keep your opinions to yourself during other people's <laughs> uh, portions, would you like to just explain your opinions of this episode? No, not really. No. <laughs> it's like, you know, you don't actually want to say anything at all. A- a- AR just has his own commentary that he needs to do. Exactly. Yeah. It's the kind of thing where I just need to talk. It's like a disease almost. Right, well, do you care to actually say anything about this, uh, this whole... Oh, of course, but I'll wait till you go. We're going alphabetically, remember? 
No, no, we're going in reverse order from the previous one. Well, I went first last time. <sighs> yes. Do I want to go last, okay? I go Joe, last. Why do you want to go last? Because I'm guiding the conversation, so, yeah, just yeah. go. Conversation. It's his job to guide the conversation. That's why I'm guiding the conversation, because if I let you guide it, it becomes what conversation? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, at any rate, daring do, I mean, daring don't, I should say, which I'm pretty sure fans made fun of for saying that a lot of the times. Anyways, yeah. so, what's this before? Anyways. Right, so... I did quite enjoy the episode, the Indiana Jones references, of course. Who doesn't like Indiana Jones? Well, except my sister's friend, Lauren. No, not Lauren, Mary. My sister herself, I actually don't care for it. Anyways, a lot of people don't care for it. At least any reference to Crystal Skull. So, uh, quite well done. I personally do like the action scenes. For some reason, it felt a bit more violent than usual. I don't know. The way she just beat up those cats it just seemed, like, violent. I don't know. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> Tad violent. Anyways, Quite a few, quite a bit of action scenes. I love how they were just sitting there in the window, staring at her, just like as she fought off every pony else. And this floor says, "Like, shouldn't we go help her?" Yeah, that's the thing. Which also, I have to say real quick, she made a miraculous recovery from that broken leg. Yeah, yeah. Or, or a it was sprained, broken, or... it was kind of sprained. Was, yeah. yeah. But Even still, still it was she... a miraculous recovery because usually those yeah. things take a long time. It was still an incredible recovery, yeah. Let's it was still an incredible recovery because first off, the sticks and the stuff she used to tie down, they're just gone entirely. So yeah, it's quite but, incredible. Um, yeah, Why is she always hurt? I don't, I don't know. know. I guess she's like my sister. Not my sister. She's got uh, the whole well, Raymond Dash thing going on where she's just constantly injuring herself in some way or another. <laughs> well, she <laughs> is an action hero. Yes. She has an action figure, obviously. But um, she's made of plastic. She's made of plastic. She's really just plastic. She was, you know what? Could have, you know what it could have been? She could have just faked her injury and then made it so they did get away. So she did want to know where they were going. It could be a thing. It's yeah, she kind of did explain that her getting captured was all like part of the plan. Part of the plan. Part of the, plan. Part of the plan. It's a perfect plan. Anyways, um. Right. I did enjoy the action. I enjoyed them staring at her through the window. It sounds a lot creepier than I made it have to be. Um, Rarity was humorous. Rainbow Dash are my favorites. I did like how Twilight and Ra- Rainbow Dash were nerdgasming the entire thing. It was just hilarious to me. Yeah. I don't know why. I, I just love when they're just talking about the whole thing. Then they had their friends just confused as to what the hell they were talking about, except Pinky. Which Pinky probably didn't even know what was going on. Hmm. Pinky she... doesn't know what's going on half the time, but she's like, it's like always me. acts like she does. Actually, she knows everything. That's just, yeah. We'll go with that. Yeah, and she's like me. But, um, yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the uh, mysterious temple that appeared out of nowhere in the northern part of Equestria. I love how rings somehow sustain an entire building and make it so it does not collapse. Quite interesting there. Oh, did, uh, did anyone see the... Uh... The layover or the map that was that was shown afterwards. Yes, yes, I yeah. said that around a few it, it, like, uh, perfectly, it perfectly fits the the map of Equestria that was drawn out by. Uh, yeah, if you follow the Indiana Jones red line uh, and like the map that or the the, the the map that they show around it, you can actually overlay it on the uh, on the official the map of Equestria. The red line doesn't actually go anywhere, does it? Though it's like a. It just kind I mean, of like goes all over the place. Well, it sort of goes all over the place, and then it ends up going up uh, into the north. It goes north, to the which, right place in the end, but yeah, <laughs> which which leads to the interesting question of why it is that a part of the uh, the map labeled on the map as the frozen north is the location of the big jungle, but eh, whatever. You know, it's cool oh, that they're actually calling their own east. map. Yeah, it is a bit off the east side of the frozen. North. West. True, so, yeah, but it, one imagines that the it, yeah you, know, that you don't have a you know frozen tundra right next to a steamy jungle. Right. I mean, so when I, you think about it, it is right next to a town that's called, labeled as Van Hoover, which is obviously a, a play off of Vancouver. So you would expect what? to see like you know Toronto. Canadian forest around it, maybe, but yeah. there wouldn't be a wouldn't be uh, a jungle they're, there. They're going for the Paul well, Indiana Jones adventure feel, and that means jungles or possibly deserts. So. If you no, want, if you want to get picky and try and uh, you know, like justify it in the universe, you could probably say that since the whole premise of what the villain is trying to accomplish is create, you know, eight hundred years of, heat. of like super heat, that this entire area should be significantly colder than it is, but it's warmed I guess, up by. I guess I don't know. Um, 
It's assumed that she didn't fly very far to catch up with the with, with you know the thieves that that stole the ring, uh, but um, the map shows to where Daring Do live, not necessarily to where the jungle was. Ah, true. But the thing is, you can see the temple from well, you can see where they're going from Daring Do's house. No, no, from where the bandits set up camp or the thieves set yeah, up camp. Where bandits set yeah, up yeah. Camp. But then like from that camp you can then see the temple. Like the thing is, they're all it's also been a way where you can actually kind of track where they're going, which is good because that's uh, it means that you can actually feel real physical space that they're uh, you know living in when they're moving around. Uh, it just has the slight problem that if yeah. you are a crazy obsessive fan and end up trying to track it over yeah. a map that there's well, some topographical problems. Right. Yeah, but also you have to remember that the question map isn't necessarily to scale with how the show actually works and everything like that. Actually, I think the, I think the uh, map even says not to scale on it. It does say not to scale, yeah. so I was going to point out it's not going to be an exact line to exactly where yeah, I was. It's, it's more... Just, I'm actually just looking at the map right now, and we're going to probably throw this sucker uh, right up onto the screen, so you people can see it as well, huh. because we've talked Sorry. about it for long uh, enough. That's funny. You I gotta go gonna back and the screen. flick it. Uh, okay, hold on a second. Uh, so yeah, if you look at the, uh, the the thing, it's less that it's in... that like It shouldn't be in this location, and more that... Uh, it, it's not that it's necessarily right next to a certain town or right in the thing and like the scale is wrong. It's more along the lines of it's in the topographical region called the frozen north. It's it's right up yeah, it's going further north than the frozen north. Yeah. Although however I'm noticing mountains now pine trees tend to be near mountains. It looked more like a foresty area where her home was. They could have moved past that and possibly towards those islands as an idea. Yeah, but yeah. then again uh, again, it's it's less that it doesn't that is impossible for it to work. It's more, it's just sort of a slightly odd thing to think about since it yeah. probably should be significantly colder than it is. But again, if you want to be enough of an obsessive fanboy to actually, you know, point out that problem, you can also then justify it by just saying, well, again, the main conflict is unnatural heat. They are in an area that is hotter than it probably should be. Well, what, uh, what do you know? Doesn't that just sort of work together nicely? It does. That and the fact that the map's not to scale, you can use that as well. Yeah. Right. Yes, again, that's not really fitting. That doesn't really fit with topography, but again, that's not really the point. The point is it's, it's so, not really a problem. Yes, anyway. So, back to the episode and your fanciful thoughts of wonder, Mr. Duhard. Uh, yeah, so the thing with this episode is I liked it. It's Castlemania was good enough that I'd call it possibly even, you know, worthy of being in my top 10 spot. This one didn't really hit that level, though, to be fair, I'm slightly biased against it in that as much as I don't dislike any of the main six, Rainbow Dash doesn't tend to hit near the top of the list mm -hmm. of uh, characters I like. I like her, I like her, it's just I don't find her episodes as engaging as I find certain other characters' episodes. However... Having said that, this is a pretty darn solid Remedash episode. Uh, I did, I was a little disappointed uh, in a couple of the choices they made, namely that one rather cool aspect of the world that I liked was the fact that there was fiction in this world, that there were stories that were not just mythology or history, that like someone had sat down and wrote them out, and that was like, oh, here you go. Here's an actual piece of like legitimate you know, fiction. And then they take that and just go like, yeah, no, whatever, it's it's real. We wanted to make this a real thing, so now it's real. It's like, oh. It shows you the power of the um, writers. They are gods among men. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. In this case. Uh, but the thing is, just sort of like, and this is a problem that I know a lot of people have actually pointed out with other things, uh, like when you have uh, certain minor characters getting developed in certain ways. Uh, and that's this idea that you, uh, whenever you, the more you tie things together, the more you shrink the world. Uh, yeah. So, for instance, uh, an example of this would be having, if we'd established the Crystal Empire before establishing Cadence, uh, and then establishing Cadence and being like, oh, here's Cadence. Also, she happened to have been, like, she's the princess of the Crystal Empire. Also, she's Twilight's full sitter. It would make the world feel smaller because we essentially are tying everything together so tightly that there's not really a lot of room to just say like that thing that to say that things exist outside of the, uh, outside of the characters mm. that there is no large living, breathing world that there's really just 
these characters and the things directly related to them, and that is the world. Mm-mm. And turning during do from a fictional story into just another set of real life adventures that are going on kind of shrinks the world a little bit. But again, it's an Indiana Jones refer- it's an Indiana Jones parody, and I love Indiana Jones, so I'm willing to forgive it for at least giving me something pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, that's in some ways uh, the Dairy Do uh, series in some ways also expanded the world a little bit because there's a lot more that goes on than just with Twilight and her friends. That's true. You can look Something at it that well. way and say, yeah, well, it, okay. It, it's the kind of thing that can go both ways. Yeah, it takes away a little bit of the realism of the world, but in exchange it makes it so that there are problems in this world that are not directly associated with uh, Twilight and company. Exactly. Uh, and I did, yeah, I did like – uh, like Oliver Company, but better. Yeah, Alex Odell was fun, though. Actually, I, my favorite new character introduced in this episode was uh, the, uh, I forget, ugh, darn, I Dr. can't remember. Dr. Cavallaro? Dr. Cavallaro, thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, that was, was a clear XP of, hold on, uh, yeah, oh, what's I his name? I, I know who you're talking about. I'm just going to look it up real quick. Yeah. Uh, the the main villain from Indiana Jones, Rares of the Lost Ark, uh, who yes. was. Yes, I don't know his name, though. Yeah, I'm just looking that up right now. It's uh, yeah. he, has he has he got a French accent? Uh, yeah, uh, Rio uh, Bellagos. Uh, yeah, uh, Rene uh, Bellag- uh, Bellagos, yeah. uh, who was the the evil French archaeologist who yeah. uh, was working with the Nazis. Damn Frenchman, always joining the other side. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> he, he was a ton of fun in uh, in you know Indiana Jones and seeing. An XP of him as being sort of like just the evil, like rival archaeologist, as opposed to just you know a ridiculously over the top pulp villain like uh, Alex Odo, was fun. I always like seeing you know more, like morally gray villains, like, yeah. not necessarily morally gray, but less evil villains, more just yeah, sort of. He's just in it for himself, so, to speak, so he's not necessarily evil, but he's... Yeah, like, the, the he's characters like the Fence Land Brothers. You know, people yeah. who you can see as having motivations beyond villainy, but who are still substantially the antagonists. Exactly. And that's what was nice about his character portrayal. and Plus the fact that overall, I think it was just a well-done story, and it was just enjoyable is what yeah. it was. It was just entertaining. It, it, yeah, exactly. And the thing is, it is an overall pretty darn enjoyable... Uh, a pretty darn enjoyable story. Uh, I guess my one other complaint with it would just be the fact that uh, <clears throat> it ties back into the Daring Do as a uh, book series and whatnot. Uh, I like Daring Do's voice a lot. Mm-hmm. I, I think it was, uh, it was well done, but it kind of runs into a little bit of the problem of it was the same voice they used in the uh, in the original episode she appeared in. And what I think kind of worked better in that episode was... Daring Do's appearance and her voice were all very clearly kind of meant to be, this is Dash. This is Dash reading a book yeah. and sort of projecting herself ah. in the world as Actually, the main the character. that's the weird thing, was that that's and, what I thought. And now it's kind of shaken that a bit because she's actually a real character. And she yeah, she's exactly she's like now Rainbow a real Dash. person who is just Rainbow Dash's idealized OC character. Yeah. But, <laughs> Like God, real it's, like, it's like Rainbow Dash was writing the episode and she inserted her OC. Yeah, it's it is a little bit weird. It's it, like it, a fan it, fiction. Is, like the thing is, it takes what is a pretty good character and a relatively decent uh, character design for uh, what they're doing, but then sort of twists in a weird way that ends up being problematic. A, a, an example, uh, like sort of a different version of the same problem came up with a friend of mine uh, when he was playing the original Assassin's Creed, uh, and that was that. He actually had this really, uh, really interesting kind of headcanon about uh, the first Assassin's Creed game, which was that a lot of the more ridiculous elements of the game, like jumping, you know, a couple hundred stories down and then surviving by landing in a hay barrel and pulling off some of the more ridiculous feats and like, you know, defeating like 20 men in a single uh, combat sword fight. Uh, where he kind of explained that way, he actually came up with a decent explanation for that, which was essentially you can explain that away as being not entirely unrealistic if you assume that because everything is uh, the memories of the character of Altair, who is extremely egotistical, mm-hmm. that you're just sort of looking at the things that happen through the lens of his memory, which he's embellished, that he sort of remembers things as being yeah. far more over the top than they were. And exactly. then in you Assassin's always Creed, exaggerate your own stories when you share them. Exactly, and then that kind of gets spoiled in Assassin's Creed 2, where you know Desmond Miles, the uh, future protagonist, starts playing the exact same stuff 
just on his own and goes from, oh, you can explain this as being sort of an egotistical mind uh, embellishing things and explaining away the historical inaccuracies to, nope, it's just superheroes. And, uh, and you know, then again, that was how it was for the very first Daring Do episode, and then this one kind of explained that away because it's all happening. It's actu- actually happening, and they're watching it happen. Yeah, but that's the thing. It, it, it takes the explanation of Daring Do basically just being Rainbow Dash with a slightly changed voice and a sl- like a slightly older voice and a slightly uh, changed color palette, but the same basic overall design, and takes it you know turns it from it's Rainbow Dash kind of projecting on this character because she's sort of imagining herself as Daring Do to yeah. just being nope Daring Do is apparently just Rainbow Dash basically. It's just oh, better. sort of a thing. Yeah. She's like Rainbow Dash Mark II. Yeah, it's, it's just a little bit of weirdness that uh, yeah. you know, worked a little bit better when she was a fictional character. Again, I like her voice, I like her design, it's just kind of a bit of weirdness that yeah. has now cropped into it because of this. At least she wasn't finding armies and armies and making it unrealistic. I just don't think I was going to train those cats well at all. Yes. Uh, oh yeah, one, 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 actually one last last little bit. Uh, Alright, I said that about the last bit, but... um. The the one other thing about the the, uh, the the thing as a written story, and this one's mostly just kind of a nitpick, but I am kind of wondering why they decided to go with, you know, uh, Daring Do is currently, actively, going on adventures, writing this stuff as fiction, while it's all about actual real world people who are actually real world doing things. It's it's a little bit like if someone, if like the guys in Steel Team Six, were writing fictional story, were writing apparently <laughs> well, fictional stories happening. about their adventures, trying to find and kill Osama bin Laden, the yeah you know, pulp villain mastermind behind Al Qaeda, but yeah. in the real world where that actually is a thing that people probably knew about, and that was kind of hard to ignore. Or like yeah. if Indiana Jones was like the whole plot of Indiana Jones was after every adventure he wrote down how he was fighting the evil fictional Nazis while yeah. World War II was happening. I think that's the it, thing. It's a little bit weird. Is what, what I'm saying. Yeah, it's slightly strange that you do it because I know I can't remember the guy's name now, but um, oh God, he writes like special forces um novels. Oh, Tom Clancy. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Tom Clancy. Yeah. Uh, Tom Clancy. And there's another guy who. Is it Tom Clancy? There's a different guy. Uh, it's like Mc something, and he was in uh, McNabb or something, and he was in the SAS. Oh, I think I know who you're talking about, but I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, and name. yeah, that's the guy because one of my friends read his books, and like, it's okay to write about it once you've left and make up stories based on your experience, but it's not generally good practice to write about the stuff that's happening while it's happening and being very true to what happened in real life because that's a real life event then. Because yeah, the thing is, not only she's doing it as fiction, she's also not doing this after retiring. She's she's just sort of like, well, I just had that adventure, and I'm probably gonna go on another one in a little bit. But um, yeah, in the meantime, I, I'm going to first. Uh, actually, going to, actually, here's the thing: because of the way that the book, the the episode ends with her publishing a book that's clearly about the adventures that she had had there, like yeah. with the ring and stuff, it means that she basically called up her publisher and said, "Hey, I'm writing this book about things that are still currently happening." But uh, because apparently things haven't actually got resolved yet when I said the deadline was done, I'm going to need another two mm. months to finish the book, by which I mean finish the adventure and then write about it. Yeah, I need to actually yeah, yeah. finish the, um, so, the thing first. Has it actually Was it actually officially stated that it was a fiction story by Twilight? I don't know if it was actually it, stated. It, it's not necessarily fiction. stated that it was fiction, per se, but like it's clear from their expressions and everything that like the fact that it all is real and the fact that they get all of their yeah. information from it from the novels. Yes, it's true. Yeah, uh, it's pretty clear that they weren't actually basing this off of like their knowledge of this as a real world event. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but so, I mean, by the way, case, um, like, like again, it never was stated as fiction. And I'm sure the story never called itself fi- like maybe she never did call the story itself fiction when she actually uh, passed them out and they just never took the time to like, fully analyze that. Well, this never said fiction on it. Oh, I see. Yeah, and the thing is, it's not like a game break or anything. It just would have been nice if they'd lampshade hung it by just going, like, wait a minute, you know, you're actually, like, daring do in real life? Yes, I am. Boom, done. But no, they're just sort of like, holy cripes, she's actually really daring do. Let's never bring up, 
let's never bring this up with her or ask her why she's writing about her own life or any like questions of the audience. She might might come back in the epic season finale where they have every single villain involved, and I don't know, maybe. But they they open the mysterious box, and out come the Cheerios in the cave. Do we ever go over who the voice actor for Daring Do was? Uh, No, who who is the voice actor? Voice actor for Daring Do is Chiara Zani, and I don't think we. I don't think she's ever done. She she hasn't done anything else in in uh, Gen okay. Four. However, she is actually a Gen Two veteran um, character. She was Bon Bon in My Little Pony Tales. Hmm. Um, well, was it a Gen Two or the second generation of cartoons? Because there are, there's a difference. Well, it was the second generation yeah. of cartoons. Okay, so so the the second Gen One cartoon then. Uh. It was 1992, so... Yeah, the, the, we're, yeah, we're, the, the, gen, yeah. The, the first series and the second series of our cartoons were both actually Gen 1. Okay. Uh, gen, do, gen 2 did not have a cartoon. Yeah. She's yeah. also done other shows like Inuyasha, and she yeah, was yeah. in um, other, uh, other so, movies so. as well. She was in, like, A Very Minty Christmas and um, two other My Little Pony movies. But oh, she's got an excellent voice. Uh, I hope to see her do some more stuff on the show. It'd be yes, nice to yes. see. Uh, I do have to say again, like you said earlier, her voice sounds quite similar to Rainbow Dash. Yeah, uh, I, I think it'd be really nice, honestly, if we got another episode with her where they kind of just, you know, it'd be nice for them to do at least one more uh, during do episode where they just sort of, you know, take at least a minute to quickly go over some of these odd, you know, elements and either explain them or lampshade hang them just so that. That is covered, and now that Darren Do is an established character, I think it's entirely possible that they will do that. Yeah. So, you know, here's hoping for another, random, uh, another Darren Do episode. Yeah, it would be nice, definitely. I'd like to see more adventure and you know stuff like that. It'd be quite enjoyable. Anyway, uh, we're just about out of time, so uh, yeah. season four, first two episodes that are not part of the uh, you know pilot. Gonna say strongly recommend season four so far shaping up to be really good. Lightning Rabbit. Lightning Rabbit. Lightning Rabbit. Yeah, that was an accident. I accidentally muted my microphone. Um, <laughs> so, I love that. Because I might have said things and they may have been ignored, but that's okay. Um, yeah, I'm I looking forward to the rest anyways. of the season. There are a few choice episodes that I'll want to see, but we'll get to that when they actually arrive. But yes, I look yeah. forward to the farming convention. Uh, let's not spoil anything. Uh, Fireball. It's not a farming convention. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I, as far as uh, season, season four goes, it looks like it's shaping up to be about the same as season two, where the very first episodes were all really good at season two. So let's hope that it continues that trend. Excellent. Cabral. I like ponies. Definitely well done. I would like to see more with the magical box of Cheerios and Twilight Cane. I want to see where that goes. Definitely. I would like to see Darren Jason. Well done episodes. Enjoyable, entertaining. Castlemania was hilarious. Awesome. Well, I think that's a big old strongly recommended for anyone who actually watches end to end but doesn't watch ponies. The Yes. Two of you who are like the the one or two of you who actually uh, who actually does that the crazy individuals who like, yeah those uh, individuals so. look at everything in the pony fandom but don't watch the show next week we will cover uh, the next episode and if we have time maybe start getting into some of the uh, backlog of comics that we haven't Flight talked about yet to the finish so till next week this has been end to end and we'll see you guys next time Please see you guys see ya.